I'm Mark Lawrence. I'm your host for today. Today, we're going to be interviewing the Paramount Chief from Abatime. And Abatime is a forestry community in the Volta region of Ghana, um, which is going to be the main beneficiary of our project today. And so today, I'm going to be talking about the carbon collectible NFTs, um, which we believe is the world's first web, web 3.0 non-fungible carbon offset. As you probably know, um, many scientists, and actually before I start there, I just want to be able to, I just want to thank the Bankless DAO, Bankless Africa, in particular Ernest, for giving us this forum for this discussion of global warming, warming web 3.0 and, and digital carbon offsets. And as you probably know, many scientists believe that global warming is caused by greenhouse gases. So when you um, fly in an aeroplane or drive a car and you've got all these factories that are emitting um, pollutants into the atmosphere, a lot of that's carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere and when the sun is shining, the heat actually goes through the carbon dioxide and comes down to the earth. It's reflected back up and the frequency is different. And so those greenhouse gases keeps the heat within the, the earth system. And so that's what these experts believe is causing the main cause of, of um, global warming right now. And so we've all got a carbon footprint and we're you know, causing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to increase and therefore go global warming. On the other hand, trees and forests are really good at removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's called carbon sequestration. And so they take the sunlight and chlorophyll um, and then um, water and they convert carbon dioxide into um, oxygen and carbon and the carbon is stored as wood in the trunks and the branches of trees and also carbon goes into into the soil and so photosynthesis is the exact opposite it's removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and forests and trees are, are really good at doing this so um what we're doing though is we're trying to focus on providing equity and inclusion for climate finance and so again, global warming is due to these greenhouse gases. There's carbon, traditional carbon offsets that allow um, people who are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to monetize um, those carbon offsets. Unfortunately, mature forests are excluded from this. And this makes sense in the USA and in Europe where these mature forests are owned by large organizations and those large organizations don't need financial incentives to continue to operate their forests. In a lot of African countries, those mature forests are not owned by large organizations, they're owned by individual farmers. And so they are excluded from the traditional carbon offset business because the carbon sequestration of their forests is regarded as being business as usual rather than additional or new. And so we've come up with a whole new set of digital carbon offsets that provide that include mature forests and our certification costs are zero dollars. So that means it's equal. Anybody can afford to participate. And in the long run, our solution is a web 3.0 solution where it's really a decentralized value exchange. In the long run, uh, owner, of one hectare of forestry will be able to stake that one hectare of forestry on our decentralized exchange and any buyer will be able to buy the carbon sequestration rights or the virtual rights to that one hectare of forestry and 65 percent or more of the value will go to the farmer whereas today for a traditional carbon offset probably less than one percent of the value goes to the farmer and so um the main beneficiary of the system that we're coming up with is the Abatime Forest. And today, that's why we invited the Paramount Chief of Abatime um, to talk to us today. So Paramount Chief, maybe what you can do is unmute yourself. And then um, what we can do is have you introduce yourself. And then I have a series of questions for you. 
And so just so that everybody knows, in, in Ghana, um, there's a, a chieftain system and the regular chiefs report up to a paramount chief and the paramount chief is, is regarded as royalty in, in Ghana. So paramount chief, thank you so much for participating today. And maybe we can start off by having you introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I take cognizance of the fact that we have little time this time around. Um, as Mark has said, I am the paramount chief or the king of the Abatime traditional area. Um, I was installed in 2008, uh, directly succeeding my predecessor, who was once upon a time the president of the National House of Chiefs. Um, I, I am a retired public officer, uh, retiring just about uh, over four years ago. And so I have a lot of public service experiences and um, I, I live in Abatime with my people. Um, I'm a married person and I'm a member of the, I'm the president of Abatime Traditional Council and then a, a, a president of Hope Traditional Council as well. I'm a member of the Volta Region House of Chiefs, once upon a time a member of the National House of Chiefs, and currently also a president of the Congress of Paramount Chiefs and Queens of the District of Who West, in which Abatimi is located. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. So um, in the US and Europe, there's a lot of large forests. Some of those large forests are owned by the government, some of those large forests are owned by organizations. And so traditional carbon offsets cannot be sold by those, those mature forests because they don't believe they need to be incentivized to manage the forest effectively. And so are the forests in Ghana managed or owned by large organizations? No, uh, no forest in, in Ghana is owned and, and, and managed by um, organizations, uh, transnational organizations. Those forests that are, um, are owned by or, or are utilized by organizations are those concessions that have been given to mining companies to, to do that. But their concession is limited to the underground of, of the land, not on the surface of the land. So uh, no transnational organization or large organizations own forests. The forests are owned and under the care of the paramount chiefs, our chiefs in all the areas in which forests are, are, are found. Uh, government has what we call the forest reserves that are managed by the, uh, of, by the government, but there are other of forest reserves which are managed by the community and the chief being the uh, the, the custodian of culture and tradition has some usufructory fractural right and and and, and alodial right over ev everything that is on the surface of the of the earth including the trees okay so then given that different organizational structure obviously if i was speaking to an organization in america and i wanted to negotiate carbon sequestration rights with them I would go to the CEO of that organization and try to sign a contract um, for the forest that they own. So given the different ownership structure in Ghana, who is authorized to decide whether to sell carbon sequestration rights in, specifically for the, the forest in Abatime? Um, the forest in Abatime, as, as I mentioned, on, uh, under the control of the, um, the paramount chief of the chief of the traditional area. And so if anyone wants to come and talk about forest and, 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 and its things, or wants to enter the forest in, in a traditional area, he naturally will have to go through the chief of the town or the permanent chief of the area. In this case, um, some will have to come and pass through the Usi of Abatimi, the king of Abatimi, before they enter the forest. So anybody who goes into the forest without that formal introduction uh, is causing some traditional um, uh, anomaly, uh, which when a situation arises, that person can be the full rigors of the traditional and customary punishment that all oh, is, that is available. Okay, and then of course, that, that is why, of course, we discussed that pro this project with you, and um, basically, 
you sent us a letter saying that you wanted to participate in this program. And so you are the authority for um, the carbon sequestration rights for the Abatime forest. And that's, that's separate from that the, is right. part of the forest. Okay. Okay. And so what is the government's position on your plan to monetize the carbon sequestration of the Abatime forest? And, and so what is their position on, on you, you know, participating in this program and then planning to reinvest some of that money in forest management activities and maybe even um, a, a, a program for to create alternative livelihoods in the community? Well, before this project of Abatime Forest Camp and carbon sequestration that you're talking about, um, I have sought to protect the forest um, in Abatime by preventing illegal logging and, and, and to make sure that bushfires are limited to a large extent. So if there's any bushfire somewhere, the community people will call me and say, oh, there's bushfires over there, and I have to summon my uh, divisional chiefs to take control by that. So before then, Avatime, through me, we have been um, trying to protect and conserve the natural forest that God has given us. So we believe that it is the forest that sustains human beings because there are medicinal plants, our uh, fauna and flora, our animals, our food even comes from the, 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 the forest. We always say we have a saying in Abatime that there is money in the forest. So we started that uh, project uh, vigorously. And before this um, Abatime forest project came up by, um, by you, Mark, which was a laudable thing that is going to support the efforts that we have been making so much to make sure that we manage the forest better. We were doing that in order to contribute towards global climate climate change that was our our motive to to not knowing that we're doing it to service other people and not our, ourselves even though we had that opportunity that our forests are green and they are very nice uh, when we need animals or meat go into the forest and do it and the trees are not supposed to to be harvested because in ghana or nationally it is known that when the last tree dies, the last man also dies. So we based on that um, that scenario to protect our forest as much as possible before this carbon sequestration project. So we thank you very much for coming and we, we are going to support it and make sure that our people also benefit from something that we've been taking for granted for, for, for quite a long time. People have been benefiting from it. Okay. And we appreciate your participation as well. So what, what can you tell us about the Avatime community? Well, Avatime community is located in the whole west district of the Volta region of Ghana, West Africa, Africa. And uh, it is the community that is lying, uh, is the highest settlement, human settlement point in Ghana. And so the climatic condition there is different from the surrounding and other parts of the country. In fact, um people who visit that time during particular times of the year think that if you stay in Apatime for some time then you'll be able to stay in any part of europe um, of course that is relative but that is that shows how the Apatime community is full of it's a tropical rainforest region uh, in the in, in the Volta region close to togo uh, the country of togo Avatime is bordered by many traditional areas uh, to the east, to the west, and the, to the all of them forested. The second highest mountain in Ghana is located in Avatime. The first one is in uh, Afajato, in the Afajato South District, north of, of, of Avatime. So we have a continuum of forest. So Avatime people are not Avis particularly. They are what we call a tribe called Guans. And so we, we speak our own dialect, our own language, and learn every or English as our second. Uh, we, the population of Avatime is, is, is estimated to have around 30,000. <coughs> uh, that have to be confirmed. And we have seven communities. 
avatime a mejope avatime vana avatime biakpa avatime jugbe peme avatime fume avatime gbajeme avatime tope which are which are all managed by sub chiefs with the paramount chief living in avatime vane superintending over all those things so if there is any activity any instruction that has to be implemented and the traditional area comes from the paramount chief through the can you hear me yes through through the traditional council which is the highest decision making body of the traditional area recognized by government uh, to the subdivisional chiefs to implement and so avatime is one of the oldest traditional areas in 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 in, in the country uh, dating as far back as uh, time can you can remember so mark that is in brief uh, what we have in abatimi um, we we are an agrarian community uh, our basic economic activity is farming um, there are a number of schools and and churches in abatimi why so because the german authority before the second world war came to Avatime and like the place. And Avatime used to be the, the, the residence of the colonial uh, master at the time, you know, because of the climatic conditions there. And the church also came there because of the climatic conditions. So we have the one of the oldest church premises, uh, church institutions in Avatime. Okay. And what can you tell us about the Avatime forest? Well, as I said, Abatime Forest is a green forest uh, in the tropical rainforest with a number of, and in fact, a plethora of trees and, and, and flowers, butterflies, animals, uh, what have you. Um, it has large trees that is as far back as time can remember, but with the current economic or poverty levels and economic uh, uh, boom, our people and strangers come in to descend onto the forest to illegally fell those those giant historical and customary trees we used to have some traditional and customary practices that prevented people from entering forests uh we we, we our forefathers designated some forests as grooves uh, or no go areas but uh, currently with the with the with the could i call it modernity or I don't know how to call it. People break those rules and just enter the forest with impunity, you know. And so the rainforest is getting depleted gradually, but not to the not not at the rate at which other surrounding trees are, are, are certain forests are getting rid because of the action of the traditional council, working hand in hand with the, the district assembly and government officials to make sure that we protect our forest. So Avatime forest is rich in, in, in it to it will not be surprising if we have some minerals down there under the sea, but we are very determined not to allow extraction um, of any sort in Avatime. Okay. And the audience that we have today really has like a, a crypto type focus. Um, does the, the local community have any knowledge of cryptocurrencies, the blockchain, DAOs, or how these innovations can help bring new financing mechanisms to the local community? Um, I will say no to begin with, because these are novel ideas that are coming up. Uh, cryptocurrency and crypto business may be happening in other parts of, 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 of the the world. Uh, in fact, when I was in the National House of Chiefs, um, there was uh, a proposal uh, for us to adopt the crypto regime, um, which a lot of people are not very, they, they, they have doubts about it because of uh, this 419 and all manner of things. You know, so I've had many people, I can say, and people mostly in, in Volta region are not very familiar with this crypto uh, management of our forest and we love to be part of that one and we also want a lot of education on it uh, particularly the, the 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 not the benefits but the, the other side of it which which a lot of people fear so they don't want to go into it 
so that we can get convinced that it is it is a, a product that we we can we can run away with run along with okay and let's assume that this project that we have that's using selling nfts to make money available um for the 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 local community if a small amount of money was made available to the local community how do you think that money should be spent basically as i mentioned earlier on since if the last two dies the last man dies that small amount initially will be used into sensitizing and reorienting people's minds about their relationship with the forest which will include forest management conservation and, 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 and um, because you can do any other project if the people don't go along with you 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 are bound to have some percentage that you will not like and so the dividends of us living in that forest area must be near to the people to protect it the reason why our forefathers chose that locality nobody knew but they found out that it was a secure place and a place that can can give them their livelihood and so if there will be any small amount of money that we would first of all use it in public education and already we have formed task forces in in the various communities and the role of the task forces uh, is to make sure that anybody that wanted wants to log or, or, or fell a tree will have to get to that task force and seek permission from it um, and they will go into the forest and see whether the tree is mature or the tree is 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 is, is good to be felled before it can fell. But of course, that that is being being um, abused because the members of the committee have been compromising themselves because of poverty. You know, if a, a chainsaw operator comes with a little bit of money, then he will just outwit them. If he wants to fell one tree, he goes around felling more than one and comes around to do so part of that money will be used to resource this team this team of uh, vigilante groups or committee to be parading and 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 uh, the forest to give them uh, the working gear identification maps give them some small allowance that to motivate them to protect the the forest and of course as i mentioned education 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 yeah, and of course, part of our plan is to develop a social innovation studio that will help figure out what some of these challenges are in the community and then coming up with different ways to solve some of those problems that will hopefully lead to some of these people starting companies, becoming entrepreneurs, creating jobs and alternative livelihoods. Because if they do have an alternative livelihood, it's less likely that they will then go and fell these trees illegally. And so to really address that root cause, we need to give people better jobs and, and better options, which is part of this program. So absolutely, um, just absolutely. change the subject slightly. There's a rumor out there that there's some type of a festival that happens every year in Abatime. Is that right? And yes. if so, can you tell us a little bit about the festival? Well, thank you very much. Um, I was telling someone just this afternoon that our forefathers were so innovative and, and, and this thing. When they traveled from wherever they were coming uh, to the present location, they carried along them, with them uh, a type of food that can be, be light to carry around, but that can grow uh, twice a year or as often as you planted it, uh, they planted it. So they carried along them uh, brown rice, which rice has sustained them over the years. And so, to recognize and celebrate that rice, we, we celebrate what we call the Avatime Mountain Brown Rice Festival, shortly put Amu Fest. Amu in, in Avatime language is brown rice. So we celebrate it every year to support the farmers, to train them, to educate them about the usefulness of continuously um, planting the rice and as a means of giving them some income and sustainability. Uh, I want to add here that the brown rice some, has some nutrition, so if which our people have, our forefathers have noticed. So from the cradle to the grave, we use the brown rice for our festivals. When a child is born, uh, the, the time before this uh, child food is, is adopted, 
our mothers used to have some pap, some fine pap made up of uh, uh, brown rice, and uh, which is so nutritious. And so it gives the child the start of uh, the start up in, in in life. And then during the process, we call something the puberty rice or kusakoko, where young girls are initiated into womanhood. And uh, during that period too, we celebrate, we use brown rice and use progress as much as possible. And then finally, when God calls you and you're going, brown rice is also one of the dishes that we, we clearly use uh, to do that because it's nutritious, it can sustain you for a long time. When you prepare the food down, that particular type of variety of brown rice can stay longer than all other varieties. That we, and of course, we are using it organically. <coughs> We don't want any 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 chemicals to come in. So the festival first is used to mobilize our local people, friends of our team, to come around to uh, for us to um, raise funds for the development of our team, of course, and then to celebrate the progress and popularize its use, because we've been told that the nutrition uh, components of that rice is good. Uh, one of the ladies who who has been championing it even said that uh, if you're developing prostate if you continuously eat that rice um uh, chances are that your prostate situation would would would, would, uh, would, would minimize and then your manhood will also be up in green so it is it's a combination of the benefits of that rice that's why we do it and of most importantly because you can grow that rice twice or three times a year. In you know, three months, you can you can you can grow it. They can grow any at any part of the rice, water or water, little water you need to grow that rice. And so this year, where this year because of COVID, last year and this year we didn't celebrate Amu Fest. We celebrate it in November each year, second week of November each year. And so we invite our friends. And I'm sure all those who are listening in now, next this next year when we are celebrating it, uh, you you have special invitation. We have a, a space allotted for you to come and participate. We want to see you there next year. Uh, we we celebrate it in all the Avatimi towns in operational basis. So we started with the Paramount C, the Paramount headquarters. Then we went around all the seven towns. We started the second round before COVID came, and so we were unable to celebrate it again. And we have a theme that that runs through the celebration that um, unity and development in Avatime through Brown's brown rice culture and eco tourism. Tourism is also part of Avatime. I mean, in the district we call Avatime the tourism hub of the district. In fact, it is also the tourism hub of Volta region because there you can stand and Sea orcas, there are a number of caves, there are a number of waterfalls, there are a number of bears, flies, and of course, our culture that is not related to the culture of the neighboring communities also is a, is, is a thing to see. And of course, the weather is also another thing. So, all these things combined help us to celebrate the Amu Fest every year. And just so that the audience know, I was there in October and I actually tasted the brown um, rice and it's absolutely delicious. So I encourage everybody to take the Paramount Chief up on the invitation to go to the festival. So um, Paramount Chief, um, just to finish this in interview, um, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience today? Well, I, I just want to encourage the audience that they should come to have a team. Um, I am not. Uh, I am not very um, uh, uncertain that this project that has been started would would up with other traditional areas very soon. Um, our next meeting of the traditional council is this Saturday, and then the following day we'll be having the Congress of Paramount Chiefs and Queens meeting uh, in, in in the district. And I'll use the opportunity to brief my people about what is happening. Of course, I've read them already. What I want you to understand is that you shouldn't um, doubt the potency of this project or the viability of this project, because it's dear to the heart of the people of Apatimi. Uh, Chief Tennessee has been guaranteed by uh, the Constitution of Ghana, Article 270, if you read it, of the Constitution of Ghana guarantees the Chief Tennessee institution. 
And so the chiefs have some alluvial title to land and, and things that are on top of the land. Um, even though chiefs may not know. The, the, the story that goes around that chiefs don't own land in the water region, I just just uh, 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 information that goes around to by some individuals to uh, uh, to put their, 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 let me put it, selfish interest in the land. But of course, uh, Atime is using the available uh, government legislation and laws to support what action that is doing. So currently, as I speak, with the help of lands and natural resources, the ministry, we have established what we call the Abatime Customary Land Secretary that is helping to document land boundaries in, in the community. And uh, recently, just last week, we met the mayor of Lance in China, and we reiterated the issue of uh, helping us develop uh, customary boundaries and traditional boundaries. So I invite everybody to pick up this role. Whatever help is there that we can give, that you can give to support the efforts that we are making now, uh, is, is welcome, highly welcome. And I think that if we succeed, we also succeed. If you are happy, if you are happy, you also be happy. So I want to thank all of you, Kelly, Mark, and uh, David, <coughs> for blazing the trail to come on their own, on their own cost or at their own cost, to get the, the first-hand information of what, what that happened. When David came, I I realized that he was. So tired that he, 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 I'm sure at the end of it all, he, he loved it and, and so to come again. And so we, we will make you citizens of Abatimi if you so wish. So you are welcome to do that because we want to take advantage of any government policy that will have our brothers in the diaspora to come to Africa. That is one other motivation that is helping me particularly uh, to welcome such things. It's a win-win situation. I will pray that when we, when we are happy, you will also be happy. And just so that everybody else knows, David is actually the president of a broker dealer, a, a US FINRA SEC um, certified broker dealer. And um, the reason he went to um, Abatime is because he is planning to extend the remit of his broker dealership to market and sell um, carbon offset. And he um, e expressed to FINRA that he was planning to do that. FINRA said that's okay. And what he wanted to do was verify the right of sale of the carbon offsets associated with the Abatime Forest as an independent third party. So he spoke with the Paramount Chief, he spoke with the government, the Forestry Commission and other people, and he actually visited the forest himself so that he could validate, you know, that the forest exists, that the trees are healthy um, and capable of, of sequestering carbon, and then um, the rights of ownership are there, and the right of sell is basically there, and it's all supported by the government. And so we've got that independent verification from a U.S. Um, so thank you for that. What I want to do is just open it up. Um, there's a couple of people on the call. And so does anybody else have any have any questions right now for the Paramount Chief? Um, <clears throat> uh, I just want, I don't have any questions. Uh, D-Side always has the great questions. Um, but I just wanted to, again, say thank you for... Um, educating us and educating anybody who's listening um, to this video um, as an American and somebody who's farmed uh, quite a bit, I understand how important it is that we never actually can imagine that there's only one tree left on this planet. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just want to like, affirm that, you know, I have, I recognize as American, my responsibility to the disproportionate amount of carbon impact on the environment that we're seeing today. And I am highly committed to, you know, doing what I can to make sure that 
yeah, our, our children never have to see the last tree. So I'm super grateful. Thank you. And thank you, Mark. And D-Side. Curtis. <laughs> Every, everybody that's been here on all these. And, and I have to say, Curtis has been our advocate. Curtis and D-Side have been our advocates within um, the Bankless DAO. They've been a great help in terms of um, certainly directing me to the resources that I need at this end to try to, you know, keep this moving forward. And so I really appreciate everything that, that Curtis and, and D-Side have done for us. D-Side, do you have any other questions or comments? Uh, sure. Thanks, Mark. And um, thank you, Paramount Chief. I mean, this is, uh, this is super cool that you took the time to, um, to explain everything to us. I really appreciate it. Um, I think this project is amazing um, for so many reasons, the environmental reasons, the cultural reasons. And, you know, I, I am always intrigued by and really interested in what the cultural um, impact of a project like this might be. So like what kind of support do you have in the, in the communities, the Abitimic communities for this project? How aware are they of what you're working on and, and this entire project as a whole? And I guess I just wanna know how it's gonna impact them. I know you got into it a little bit, but um, how do they feel about it? Well, I think that the question is for Mark. That's all for me. It's for you, Paramount um, Chief. I think it's okay, for you. All right. I, and, and I'm asking okay. you because I, I know that you, you know, you're know you in touch with the, the people on a daily basis and you're you're there, you're living there. How is it going to affect their, their lives? Well, um, l let me just mention that it's, 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 it's a welcome project that uh, um, Am I, am I online? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it's a welcome project uh, for the entire community. Um, as I mentioned, the importance of forests is, 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 is dear to the house of everybody. And everybody knows that uh, when climate change is coming, people have started complaining already that the weather is changing, the rainfall pattern is changing, it's affecting their farming communities. Uh, rainstorms come and rip off the the, the, the the roofs of people. They destroy farms. Floods come. You know, just those are the effects of climate change. So anything that we can do to make sure that the people are safe, safe customarily, and safe to do go about their their economic activities is welcome. It will impact their lives because it would it will. If, if we do it, the, the traditional method of gaining income or livelihood is going to be, I believe, is going to change and other innovations may come in, for instance, um, snail farming, beekeeping, um, shroom farming, other skills that, that, that the project would, 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 would develop. Um, teenage pregnancy would, would reduce because People don't have jobs to do, and and the young girls fall prey to the young men who give them pitances to get them. I think that um, women, particularly, uh, will, will benefit because we want to emphasize on the cultivation of the mountain brown rice, which is their preoccupation. Um, it it's cultivated once a year, but this year. Uh, through our intervention, we experimented a thing to find out whether we can cultivate it twice a year. And we have established cooperative groups in each of the traditional areas. So as I speak now, there are seven cooperative groups that are working. One of the cooperative groups took up that challenge and cultivated the first batch of rice in March this year. And I, I tell you, it was amazing. Uh, when I interviewed the, the, the people, they said they had too much rice that they cannot go into the major season again. Somebody else will also go and farm. For me, that is an indication that they, 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 are, they, they have accepted that they should farm the, right, the rice twice in a year. So what it will do, it will tremendously change the lives of the people. But as I mentioned, changing the lives will start from changing the minds of the people and their way of life and their yeah. understanding. 
their relationship with the, the environment. And so I believe that this project, if, if, if we put our hearts to it and our minds to it, will change, will give a lot of jobs to our people. Uh, currently, the young men are all doing what they call Okada, motorbike. I mean, somebody starts something and the other person comes. Uh, people need just a little bit of money to start small businesses. Women need something to start with a table shop, a table stop uh, uh, selling sales. They cannot have business. And so if we can have a situation where little monies can remain in their hands, then they can send their children to school, they can take care of their health needs, they can take care, they can also contribute towards the development of the of the community because now I cannot tax anybody too much to give to support the traditional or the uh, festival. I, I can tell you that when we started, it was hell of a trouble to raise funds. And I believe that if this project comes and there is an understanding that we are not saying that this project is going to solve all the problems, no. In our own way, we would use our uh, internal strengths and, 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 and potentials to also support some of these things that we are doing. But we need a startup. I can tell you an example. The corporate groups that we have formed, some of them need some small money to buy Wellington boots or cutlasses. I used to do that for them, buy cutlasses and send them to, to them to encourage them. You know, but that cannot continue forever. The idea that I want to bring to them is that they must also begin to understand that if somebody gives you money, you have to pay back. You know, so that kind of business uh, transaction should, should, should develop. So I believe that is going to change the culture and, 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 and culture of livelihood in Abitimi, basically. Thank you. Enes, have I, have, I, have I answered you? Yeah. I don't know, Enes. I okay. said thank you. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you did answer me. That was, I mean, I really appreciate it. And it sounds to me, you know, with, with, a, with something, a project like this, I often wonder if the local community is open to it or if it's, or if it's being forced upon them. But it sounds to me, it sounds to me from what you're saying is that they're open to it. They're welcoming it. They, they want to evolve into, uh, they, they want their economy to evolve essentially, right? Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, and these side, I, I'd like to add some information here based on my observations when I was there. And so, and I keep going back to this concept of additionality, which is this exclusionary concept with traditional carbon offsets that says, if you've got a mature forest, you cannot monetize it by selling traditional carbon offsets. Again, that makes sense in America. It makes sense in Europe, where these mature forests are owned by these big organizations who do not need financial incentives. But when you have a mature forest in Abatime or other low-income um, communities in Africa, the forest is their only source of a potential source of income. And so if there's a mechanism to help them monetize that mature forest, but that mechanism is not available to them, that policy of additionality is great in America, it's great in Europe, it's absolutely disastrous in Africa. And it actually has exactly the opposite of the intended effect, because what it means is that, you know, some of these communities cannot monetize that mature forest in the traditional way by monetizing the carbon sequestration, and so you end up having some of these youth who will go and do illegal logging like the, the Paramount Chief was, was alluding to. And so this policy of additionality can actually incentivize deforestation, which is exactly the opposite of what it's trying to do. And also it can cause conflict in the community where maybe the younger people are saying, you know, we need a way to monetize our forests and maybe the elders aren't doing enough to come up with new ways to monetize the forest. And so it can actually cause conflict in the community. And so while, you know, this concept of additionality has got a good grounding in the US and in Europe, it's absolutely disastrous for Africa where it can cause community conflict, 
and it can actually um, cause deforestation. And so that's why we have come up with a completely different concept for um, monetizing carbon sequestration. And again, to us, it's more of a Web 3.0 type solution where in the long run, the owner of the land, the owner of the one hectare of forestry will be able to stake their forestry into this marketplace and anybody will be able to buy the carbon sequestration rights or any digital or virtual rights directly from the owner of the land or directly from the farmer. And initially, 65% of the value will go to a farmer, where today, for a traditional carbon offset, they probably get less than 1%. So today, 65% of the value will go to community. And in the long run, we should be able to increase that to 85% or more. And so that's why we're here today. We're trying to use NFTs and other blockchain related technology. In our case, it's satellite imagery, it's machine learning, artificial intelligence, a DAO, and also um, NFTs to bring Web 3.0, Web 3.0 solution to a pre-existing challenge that exists in the community. And hopefully this will be a way to fund forest management activities, forest security, and also a social innovation studio, which will help those local entrepreneurs solve those challenges in a way that is sustainable and profitable so that they don't have to keep coming back to us to fund it. And we will help deliver the skills they need to be local entrepreneurs, whether it's uh, the mushroom farming or whatever the solution is that they come up with for those alternative solutions. And then hopefully we can deliver a pool of funds where they can get the startup funding they need to get these businesses going and then replenish that pool of funds so that that pool of funds grows over time. So that's what we're trying to do. That's a solution that we're proposing and that's a solution that we're implementing. So um, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Let me add something to what Mark has said, a practical example. There is a notorious uh, uh, chainsaw operator in my village. And uh, when this issue came for him to the login. A simple question that he asked me was that, what do you want me to eat if I don't go into the forest? So he's always in the forest. He's secreting the forest, you know, and for him is the livelihood that is making him to do what they have to need to eat. But I believe that if people understand that there is some carbon offset cost or some money that is coming from the forest that they are not work, working for, but just to protect it, and to continue to have that sustainable come from the forest my limit, my limit, without my limit. the Yeah, and, and that, that exact is. person is the person yes. we want to help to convert into an entrepreneur so yes. that that person can get an alternative livelihood that makes more money than illegal logging. And once we can do that, then we solve that problem for that one person and then we can solve these other problems like you know you're talking about the ladies who need additional funding to help them you know with the farming that they need to do and then we can start solving those problems one at a time but solve them in a way that's sustainable and profitable so that they don't have to keep coming yeah. back to, to us for funding and then that pool of funds will grow over time to help them um, continue in that new livelihood so that's the goal Okay, so if there's no other questions, we can bring this interview to an end. And again, I'd like to thank um, the Paramount Chief, the, the King of the People of Abatime again for his time. Um, we really appreciate this because there isn't a good understanding here of the chieftain system and the land ownership situation and the rights and who has the rights to sell um, these carbon sequestration rates. And so I, I think you've, you've answered those questions. And again, we really appreciate your time and we thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I haven't forgotten Curtis uh, for the wonderful things that you're doing. And of course, there is my colleague, the Paramount Chief of Aplau Traditional Area, Ajonugaga Aminyafiti, who 
was a link person to this project. Um, he lives along the coast, and for him to embrace this project and make it available to me, I need to appreciate him so much for that. And Curtis, thank you so much for the work you are doing. You know that this is an offside work that you are doing, but put more effort in it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, and bye for now. Okay. Bye. Bye.